They're reading from uh, from Luke 10, 1 through 4, and 10 through 16. After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take any purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Good morning, everyone. Morning. We are nearing the end on uh, the At War uh, series here. We're going to do this one, then we have one more next week, and then we enter the Easter season. So uh, this is a little bit different. Um, I was going to bring some snakes and scorpions for the, the elders to, to handle today in front of you all, but um, I didn't give them a heads up, so I didn't want to just throw it on them at the last minute. So, But we'll look at that pastor today because, as you know, there are, some churches, how uh, insignificant they might be as far as Christianity goes, that actually takes that literally, that uh, and during their services, pick up snakes, venomous ones, and, and scorpions, they're venomous, and, and I don't know what they do, juggle them, I don't know what they do, but we're not going to do that today, so you're welcome. <laughs> but what we're gonna, I'm going to look at the passage and see what it actually says. So uh, typically this is a, a, a passage of scripture that is read you know, during missionary conferences when we talk about world missions, uh, but it really comes under the head of, of how does Jesus really approach and tackle uh, the greater uh, spiritual battle that is going on cosmically. We've been talking about up to this point about how that affects us, right? How you know sin affects us, how our own selfishness, and how all that impacts us, and what we're to do in the communities around us. But what about what's going on behind the scenes, right? In the big cosmic battle that we're not really aware of uh, too much. We wake up, we you know put on our clothes. We don't really think, I wonder what the angels and demons are fighting over today. We don't really think that way, right? But there's a cosmic battle going on, and Jesus alludes to that that here. So we're going to look at that passage. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, begin to jump into what Jesus said here. Father, as we um, uh, tackle this uh, somewhat familiar passage in many ways, sometimes a, a little bit unfamiliar to certain portions of it, God, we again pray that you would enlighten us by your spirit, God, teach us the things that you want us to know, uh, help us to understand your word, that, that we might worship you in that. Um, you have given us your word, God. You have spoken to us. It's been put in a book, uh, there's nothing neater that you could have done to us to communicate to us your will and what you desire for each one of us as we seek to follow you. So open our eyes to these things. Help us not to take your word for granted or ignore it. Help us to uh, dive right in with all of our spirits today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing in the first four verses, just kind of, kind of, kind of give you a background what's going on here, is really about the urgency of the call that Jesus places upon the, the 72 uh, witnesses that he sends out. So let me just read those first four verses again. It says, uh, after this, what happened before, not, not really relevant for today, but the Lord appointed 72, or it could be 70, depending on the manuscript. 72 is a better reading, but it could be 70, but it doesn't really matter. We'll get to that in a second. Sent to, appointed 72 others, that's instead of the apostles, the 12, and, uh, and sent them out two by two, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or, or sandals and not greet, do not greet anyone on the road. And so Luke is really the only gospel that records the sending out of the 72. And in this passage, Luke uh, highlights uh, some of the, uh, 
the anticipation that Jesus begins to tell his disciples for the reaching of the Gentile world. It really uh, foreshadows this universal mission that Jesus will have uh, to all people. But in this time right here, what the 72 are doing, they are just missionaries to the Jews. As you may be aware, Jesus limited his mission initially to only the people of Israel. And so while Jesus' mission was to all of Israel, we carry on that. Today's church mission is the same as what's happening here, except to the whole world. The mission for Christians today is the same as for the 72 people who gathered around Jesus 2,000 years ago. We must tell other people about the coming of God's kingdom and the coming of Jesus to the world to save sinners. That's what the 72 are go going to do. They're going before Jesus gets there, and they're preaching the gospel so that when Jesus shows up on the scene, there's context to the message that Jesus is to bring to those towns. And it's the same thing to us. We're to present the gospel, bring people context to their lives so they can see where they stand before God. So number 72 or 70, you know, why, why that number of people? Why didn't it, wasn't it, why wasn't it 34 or 12 again? Or why wasn't it, you know, 100? Why was it 72 or 70? Well, the number is symbolic. Uh, a lot of times Jesus would use these numbers. As a matter of fact, the Bible as a whole many times uses symbolic numbers to, uh, to, to show something. In our culture, we don't do that so much anymore. Um, you know, we, we have standardized numbers. Like when you buy eggs, you buy, I um, mean, 12 does it, right? So things are kind of split up four, you know, four in a pack. We have those, but they're not symbolic of anything. They're just numbers of convenience. But in the ancient world, especially among Israel, numbers had symbolic meaning. So 72 or 70 uh, are the number of nations in Genesis 10. If you read through Genesis chapter 10, you have 72 nations listed there. Okay, it's kind of a traditional number of nations in the world. Um, the number of elders who helped um, Moses in Exodus 24 is the same number, 70 or 72, depending on, on the manuscripts. So it, it symbolizes the Gentile nations through whom Jesus would eventually uh, preach the gospel, brought by the disciples, of course. And so even though this mission is actually confined to the Jews, Jesus is foreshadowing that the mission would expand beyond the Jews into the Gentile nations. Any good Jew would know that 72 was a number that represented the Gentile nations of the world. And so by choosing and sending out these 72 disciples, Jesus was symbolically showing that the nations of the world will one day also hear his message. That's why he says, go out. But the harvest is sending them out. If the harvest is so important, why did he send out 300? Right? He had a lot of disciples at this point. Right? It's, again, it's symbolic about the number of workers that would be needed to harvest the whole world because he is the Lord of the harvest. And so... Uh, this is an important point. Remember, the Gospel of Luke was written to Gentiles primarily. And so this was important for, G for Luke to get across that this was Jesus' purpose here. And so Jesus says in this harvest a number of things that could maybe you know, stop us in our tracks a little bit. He says, first of all, it's going to involve intensive labor and possibly danger. Um, the workers are few. Send out workers. I mean, workers do what? work, right? There's going to be some labor involved. And it's not just the labor of one, but it's going to be need the labor of many workers. And he's going to send them out like uh, lambs among wolves. Not very, I mean, thank you for being very encouraging, Jesus, right? It's like not the most encouraging thing Jesus is saying, right? It's, it's, it's like me saying, uh, son, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you out to that, to that neighbor's house to um, get some sugar. And, and I know they've shot at you before. <laughs> but we really need the sugar. I mean, why don't we go to the next house, you know? So this, you know, what is Jesus saying here? But Jesus uh, explaining what the situation would be. That there's a world that's against them, right? There's a world that we talked about that stands against truth. There is a, a two kingdoms at war here on the earth. It, life is dangerous if you seek to follow that what is true. And so the use of the word lambs here that Jesus uses, uh, in other places he uses to talk about how much he loves and cares for. But here he's using the word lambs to refer to their vulnerability. Lambs are very vulnerable. Lambs are not the smartest creatures that walk the earth. And to put a lamb in a hostile setting is to almost guarantee that the lamb is not going to walk away uh, in very good condition. So Jesus is trying to say, it's dangerous. It's going to be dangerous out there, but it's also urgent. 
And so when something's urgent, we tend to take on more dangerous tasks, don't we? If something's not urgent, whatever, we don't, we don't want to enter the danger. But if something is pressing, if something is, 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 has to be done, we are willing to take on that, that, um, that danger. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across here. There, there is some urgency here. And if, if we're going to accomplish the mission that Jesus has called us to, we have to be willing to go into dangerous places. And Jesus says this to, to, to comfort them after he has told us it's going to be dangerous. Emphatically, it says, but I am sending you. I'm not just sending you alone. I'm sending you. you. You don't have to fear danger from the wolves because you have a protector. Nothing will harm you. It's going to be dangerous. You might get some scratches, some cuts there. But those four words, I am sending you, is meant to be a comfort. If Jesus were not sending them, then their mission would be foolhardy. They would go into a place that was dangerous on their own power, with their own plans, with their own itinerary, and being lambs among wolves, they would be asking to be slaughtered. But because Jesus was sending them, something changes. They can face danger from every opposition, but their very defenselessness would cause them all the more to depend on God. And that's exactly what God needs us to do. He needs to understand that without him, we have no power. We have no hope. And when we come to that place, then we can realize where the power comes from and what God can do for us and through us for his glory. Which brings to the second point. What exactly power did those witnesses have? So the second point is really about the power of the witnesses. In verse 16, Jesus kind of goes through some more verses talking about what they can and can't bring and what they should do when they enter a town. It's not really relevant for today, but I encourage you to read that to get the full context. But after all that discussion, he says this, verse 16. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. And so Jesus is emphasizing here that disciples were going to be his personal representatives. That of all the people of the earth, the God of creation who came flesh as a man says, I choose you to be my representatives. I choose you to be God's representatives on this earth, on this mission. You see, in ancient times when um, you dealt with a messenger, it was just as if you were dealing with the person who had sent them. Okay, different Again, different in our world. We send a messenger that if the messenger says something stupid, we say, I didn't tell that guy to say that. That's not for me. I disavow what that person says. In the ancient world, you couldn't disavow what your servant said or your representative said. What they said was what you were saying. So you have to be very careful in your instructions. And you notice the instructions Jesus gives us for mission are repeated throughout the Gospels and throughout Paul's writing. He wanted to be very clear what the task was. And so therefore, because the, the messenger is just as if that person was there, the people who accepted the message of Jesus of disciples were accepting Jesus. Whatever the disciples said were the words of Jesus. They were just the same. We talked about this in Ephesians 6. Remember that the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the rema, the spoken word, right, has power. That's what Jesus is saying. Here. You have power. You have authority to do the mission that I'm about to send you on. And so, likewise, the people who rejected the message of those disciples, those 72, we're rejecting Jesus, and because Jesus and God are one, and rejecting Jesus, you also reject God the Father. And so the messengers could take their mission seriously. They could take it um, soberly because Jesus did. He was sending them out with a message that had great power and had his authority to back it. And so there's a question we're not going to get into today, but how much authority do believers have? Right. What, what did Jesus give us for authority? Did he give us all authority? I mean, it, you know, the, the word all authority, I use the scriptures. Do we, do we have all authority to do anything, to say anything, and it should happen because of the authority is? Or do we have some measure of authority? We have authority, but not the full authority. Um, so the answer to that question is another message down the road sometime. Because we can, it's really a deep theological sort of discussion here. So I'm not going to get into it today, but I, I want to say this. What's clear from this passage, which is what we're working on today, is that we have the authority to preach the gospel with power. 
It, it, don't worry about what you might have. Worry about what you know. And you and I, as disciples of Jesus, just like these two 70, these 72 were, we have the authority to preach the gospel as if we were speaking the words of the Lord ourselves, and we were to do it with power. This is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians for his ministry, 4 through 5. He says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And so even Paul understood that the words he was speaking were not just his words. They were the words of the Lord. Um, this is a, I mean, a concept I, th I think that we, maybe we know, but we don't understand, right? That when you open your mouth and share things of God's word, you were speaking the words of Jesus. Do you understand how much God trusts you with his eternal Amen. word to give us that privilege? Amen. And we shirk back sometimes. We, we're fearful of it. We, he has given us this privilege. Should we be fearful? Sure. We're, we're lambs among wolves. But he sent us. And so uh, these followers of Jesus went out with authority, armed with the power that's in the gospel. And I believe, like Paul, they went out with great conviction that they were serving the living God, that they understood what the mission was, and with great conviction they were they were out there doing it. And so the first question with this is, is that your attitude? Is that my attitude? Is that your confidence when you walk out your front door every morning that you have that same confidence, that you have authority, armed with the power of the gospel in your hand? See, these 72 unknown, we don't have their names, unknown disciples had the confidence and the attitude that Jesus had commissioned them with. And because of that, stuff happened. Because of that, stuff happened. So what exactly, that the power was manifested because they went out with the authority of Jesus into the world. So the third point is the power of Jesus' name. This is what they said when they came back. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name so the 72 return rejoicing now this might be kind of a um a synopsis of what happened i don't think it, it could have but i don't think the 72 all came back at the same time kind of overwhelming jesus remember they're going to different towns different parts of ancient israel right all over the place and they're probably coming back and reporting to Jesus what is going on in this town, in that town, this this town saved that town fit to kill us, whatever it is, whatever their mission was, they're coming back reporting to Jesus. And so Jesus is rejoicing with them that the mission is being complete. He's praising God for the defeat of Satan and, and that, that, that God has chosen to use these humble servants to advance his kingdom. But the, the disciples come back and they, they're surprised because they knew they had the authority of Jesus to preach the gospel, but something even more happens. Something's happening in the spiritual realm. The, the demons are submitting to their name. And so since the disciples functioned as Jesus' representatives, they had the power of Jesus' name when they casted out demons. That's the essence of submit. Uh, they submit to your name. They were, whenever they told a demon to do, the demon did. It wasn't because, you know, Ralph or Bob or, or you know, Susie said it, whatever the names were. It was because it was in Jesus' name. It was the power of Jesus they were given. So they did what Jesus was doing in the power and authority of Jesus, and stuff happened. So just to clarify, in Jesus' name is, is not some magical words that grant a person's every wish. Uh, Lord, I, I would really like to have a full head of hair and, um, and cook supper every night for me from some <laughs> magical being and, um, and a nice car. In Jesus' name, that sold it. That settles a deal, right? I can look out my window. That's not how it works, right? Because in his name means they invoke the power and authority of Jesus. That's what in his name means. Again, in the ancient world, names represented a person's being, their power. So Jesus' name had power. They were his representatives, and because of that fact, they had power. So they were just tagging it in, in Jesus' name as if they didn't mean anything. They were saying, in the name and the authority of Jesus, I command this. In the name and the authority of Jesus, I tell you this is the truth. They knew where their authority lied. They knew where their power came from. They trusted fully in it, and things happened. And then the fourth point, 
is Jesus kind of points to them out where that power reiterates where that power comes from. This is really about the power of the cross. And so Jesus replies to that, that the demons are submitting to their name. He says this, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And so the 72, again, they see great results as they go out and they, they serve Jesus. They're elated by the victories. They're elated by what they had witnessed, what the power of Jesus manifested through their ministry. Don't you guys want that, right? Don't you want to see, like, power in your life? Don't you want to see God do amazing things through you? It comes from understanding who you were and who you are and what your call is. And so Jesus, the scripture indicated Jesus shares in the enthusiasm, but he also wants them to make sure they get their priorities right, right? He wants to remind them that their most important victory is not in driving out demons or in having a successful preaching ministry or having a big church or whatever it might be. Their greatest victory is if their names were written in heaven and they were part of the family of God. That's where it all starts. And that honor was more, would be more important than any accomplishment they would ever make. It's more important than any accomplishment you or I will ever make. So Jesus says, let's kind of work through these statements. They come back, they drive out demons, the demons are submitting to us, and Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay, what's Jesus thinking there? Um, so it's kind of mysterious, and there's a number of ways to, to understand it, a number of kind of theories of what Jesus is, is, is saying there. The first one, it says that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. It could be that Jesus saw as in a vision or kind of in his brain, whatever, Satan falling like lightning from heaven. That phrase, like lightning from heaven, means to fall from a place of power, right? So he saw Satan fall from his place of power during the ministry of the disciples. The disciples are going out, they're doing this, they're driving out demons, and Satan's power is waning. He's losing his power step by step, demon by demon, person that believes in Jesus by person. So Satan is suffering a notable defeat as these 36 uh, pairs of, of men are around the countryside, casting out demons, preaching the gospel. And so what this is saying is, what Jesus is saying, it's explaining the significance of the power of Jesus' name. They, they, the demons were cast out in your name, Jesus, as I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. His power is waning because my name is now being proclaimed over the heavens. So that's kind of the first idea. Uh, something similar, another view is that Jesus had seen his ultimate victory of Satan at the cross. That when he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, he's looking forward to what would happen at the cross. John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32 says that uh, at the cross that Satan would be judged and be driven out, right? So maybe Jesus is looking forward to that time of his death coming up. And so all the exorcisms, all the defeats of, of Satan's power confirm the certain the certainty of the ultimate victory at the cross. So Jesus is looking forward to the ultimate victory where Satan is defeated at the cross. Another view says that Jesus was just telling of, a, of the original fall of Satan, that he saw Satan fall from heaven. It's a, a warning to the disciples of their pride. They're getting all prided up on, you know, we're driving out demons. This is a pretty amazing thing. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. And I was there when his pride caused him to fall you're in danger to the same thing if you start trusting in yourselves. Now, I don't necessarily ascribe to that so much because they said, we're, we're driving out demons in your name. So they knew where the power was coming from, but maybe that's part of it too. So he's basically saying, remember, your pride is akin to Satan's downfall. So, so be careful, uh, disciples. So uh, all three could have been in Jesus' mind. I think we sometimes forget that Jesus and even his followers had a wealth of biblical themes in their brain. And so many times when they talk and uh, saying things, they're not just drawing from one portion of Scripture. They're drawing from many portions of Scripture. We find this in the book of Matthew. When Matthew quotes Scripture, he says, as the prophet Isaiah says, and he quotes the prophet Isaiah, but it's not only Isaiah. It's a little bit of Jeremiah thrown in there and some Zechariah too. But he didn't say it's the prophet Zechariah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. He just says Isaiah. It's all the same God who wrote it. And so the themes were maybe blended into, maybe Jesus had all these things, at least in part, in his, in his mind. Um, again, they were ingrained in Jesus' mind from birth as well as the disciples. But what is clear 
no matter which you know angle you look at, what is clear is the power of these spiritual forces were failing. That something was happening where Satan was losing ground. And as we talked about before, that chain was getting shorter and shorter that bound these demons. And the more we approach the final victory of Jesus at the cross, the more and more the freedom of the demonic world had to wreak havoc around the world. And so Jesus tells them, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Okay, what does that mean in context? I mean, again, if it's about really trampling snakes and scorpions, what does that have to do with the passage? Oh, by the way, I want you to know if you run into a snake or scorpion, you step on it, right? I mean, is that what he's saying? No, there's something going on here. Jesus is not saying, and so you're off the hook, he's not saying you have actual power over snakes and scorpions. If you see a venomous snake coming towards you, do not say, in Jesus' name, I bind you. I'll be visiting you in the hospital. And I, want, I don't like hospital visits. So he's not saying that. Snakes and scorpions, if you read through the Old Testament, almost every time snakes and scorpions are, are symbols, Old Testament symbols of evil. They're representative symbolically of all kinds of evil. So these dangerous creatures are fit symbols for what's going on with these satanic forces that are opposing Jesus. In fact, the next clause actually tells you what the snakes and scorpions represent. It says, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Snakes and scorpions equals all the power of the enemy. No matter what Satan throws at you, what his strategy is, you have the authority and the power to overcome all the enemy throws at you. Take up the shield of faith. With it, you can what? All right, you can extinguish all those attacks. Same thing, different different words here. And so Jesus here is, is tempering their enthusiasm a little bit. He's saying, look now, guys, I, I know you're really excited that your, your church is growing and there's thousands of people there and people responding to your preaching and coming up after you and going, good good message, disciple, that pat you in the back, that's going great, but that's not what I want you to rejoice in. I don't want you to rejoice in that because something greater has happened. There's been a greater spiritual victory that I don't want you ever to forget that you have had, right? And that victory is what they have done with Jesus. The ministry was not to become an experience of power leading to pride, but an experience of servanthood out of love for God and of desire for more people to join him in the kingdom, more names written in heaven. He wanted them to realize that the most important thing that ever happened to them was not that demons fled, or preaching was accepted, or small groups were started, but that their names were securely in that book in heaven. So here's the application. The harvest is here. Jesus foreshadowed it for, for the Gentile nations. It's here. It has been here for 2,000 years now, roughly. Uh, these 72 disciples that went out were not unique in their qualifications. There were 72. The, the, look, Jesus doesn't say that I'm choosing you because you have some great teaching gifts and you know, really good administration. He doesn't mention anything like that because the qualifications really didn't matter. What mattered was Jesus was sending them. One of my favorite passages is in, the, in Acts where um, the disciples are preaching boldly and the leadership says, and they noted that these men had been with Jesus, right? And so it wasn't they know that they were lowly fishermen. They, they know that. It didn't matter what their qualifications were. They know that they had been with Jesus. And so these 72 were not better educated, more capable, or of higher status than any other follower of Jesus. They were just 72 disciples. What equipped the 72 for this mission was their awareness of Jesus' power and their vision to reach all the people that God had sent them to. Christians, you and I, we should dedicate our skills to God's kingdom. That's what we're here for. But we should also be equipped with his power and have a clear vision of what he wants us to do. So where do you stand? Four, four questions to ask yourself today. This is the battle that we're in. This is the great cosmic battle that God has asked us to be part of as he harvests the world for him. First question is, is this, or statement. I will dedicate my skills to kingdom ministry. Yes or no? See, you, you only have so much time in your life, almost so much time in a day, 
and you've been gifted with skills, natural skills, and spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Are you going to leverage them for kingdom ministry? Because you can, frankly, take them and leverage them for self-ministry, right? You can do a lot of things to make your life easy, avoid the wolves. You can do a lot of things to make life more comfortable than, than, it, than it might need be. Um, and you can leverage all those skills and gifts that God created you with for those things. Or, or you could leverage them for the kingdom of God and build something that's eternal. This is why Jesus over and over said, don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy them, but store up treasures in heaven where they're protected, they're confined, right? They're, they're eternal. And so uh, will you dedicate your skills to kingdom? And just, this is an act of the will. You have to choose. So, yeah. And then begin doing it. Um, our default is to leverage our skills for us. That's what we do. We get a job that we like. Why? Because I like that job. Ever think God might call you to a job that you don't like because there's some other benefits that you could use to leverage it for ministry? Do we even think like that anymore? Right? Because are you here to work a job you like? Is that why you were created? Maybe. Or were you here primarily to have a job where you can leverage yourself for the kingdom of God? I mean, we need to start thinking like God thinks. Otherwise, we won't be doing things like God does. The second is, I trust Jesus for power to do what he calls me to. Are you relying on your wonderfulness? Or are you relying on Jesus' power? Um, he's, he's given it to us. He's given us uh, at least a measure of his authority. And he's given us his power. Paul availed himself of it. The disciples availed themselves of it. And you and I can too. But we have to die to self in order for that power to be manifest in our lives. And if you're going to um, do that, then you have to understand what the call is in your life. Do you have a clear vision of what your call is? I know I've talked about this over and over again, but I talk about it over and over and over again because probably most of us here, if I'm honest, you don't know what your call is. You don't, you're not really clear uh, what you are called to do. And so if you're not clear what you're called to do, we tend to we tend to using our time to do other things rather than leveraging that time to do what we're good at, right? If I was a skilled brain surgeon, right, and I go, you know what? I want to spend all my time, I don't know, reading magazines. I like reading magazines. But I'm a skilled brain surgeon. And there's two or three people in my congregation, right, who, who have brain problems that need surgery. And I go, I know you have some brain stuff going on there. But I really like reading magazines. Would that be a problem? We all live our lives like that if we don't know what our call is. Because we're reading magazines when we should be doing this or that. Understand what you're called. See, Jesus was very clear with you, 72. I want you to go out, and I want you to do this and do this, and don't do this, don't take that, don't do these things. You should have a plan for your life. I should have a plan for my life. Go out, do these things, do that thing, leverage that skill. Don't use that, that's stupid. But do these things, and don't do this stuff. And then you will have authority and power. And then finally, are you aware of your sources of pride? Because once you start doing that, and you start doing things in Jesus' name, we go, oh, that's pretty cool. And we forget that we do things in Jesus' name because it's actually him doing it through us. It has nothing to do with me at all. I've just placed myself in a place of, of power as it, he flows through me. So in Christian service, there is no unemployment. There is no unemployed Christian. Everyone should be working hard. There's enough work for everybody in the church. There's enough work for every believer. No believer should sit back and watch others work. That's the most unloving thing we can do, to just watch other people slave hard for the kingdom while we sit back and reap the benefits. And, and why do we work hard? Jesus told us, because the harvest is great. There needs to be workers in the field. You and I need to know where our fields are what our call is, where the commander has sent us to go and engage the enemy. Because you have a place. Where is it? Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that, uh, that Jesus had this great vision for his ministry, that he had a plan to, to reach the people of Israel and then the nations of the world so that he might be exalted to his rightful place. God, Jesus knew everything he was about to do. He didn't guess regarding anything. Uh, he knew what his call was. He knew about the cross, and he set his face towards Jerusalem. Father, we're not Jesus. We're, we're not certain of a lot of things. But we are certain of what you've shown us, God. We can act on what you've told us to do. We, we can go forward and trust you in the areas that you've told us to trust you in. We might not know all things. We might not be sure about where we're ultimately heading. But we do know, God, because you have shown us what the next steps might be. So I pray for myself and each one here that you might give us the wisdom and discernment to know what the next step would be. Maybe it's just the first one that I choose today from this day forward to leverage everything I have for the kingdom of God. And from that point, God, we'll just, we'll just move forward. God, we're trusting you for the authority and power that you have given us through your name. And it's in that powerful name we pray. Amen.